All right, so here's what I'll do. Well, actually, let's start. Since you're the one who's here, let me ask you, as we're doing this review for the third exam, chapters 8, 9, and 10, I, I, I have a list of um, questions you know, that have been emailed to me, obviously. So would you prefer me to, to go through those emails? Oh, stop. Sorry. Would you prefer me to go through those questions one at a time that I have emailed to me? Or would you like to um, ask me questions? Um, you can just go over the emailed ones. All right. And that's what I'll do. And then afterwards, um, I'll ask if you have any additional questions. So I like that plan. Here we go. Let's see. Let me share my screen, or at least a portion of it. Where are you at? Where are you at? Hmm. Sorry, I'm trying to I have a, about a million and a half tabs open. So I'm trying to find the correct one. Let me try something else. There we go. All right. So share tab. Biology 101. That should do it. All right. And you can see my screen, right? You can see where I'm looking at Google Classroom. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So let me go to the email. Looks like the first one I'm going to answer is chapter eight, question 32. So, and I wanted to start from the screen because some people have yet to do a single um, study guide. So it'd be nice to show them how to do it, how to find them, um, just in case they all of a sudden took an interest. So first of all, I sent that, I put a post out not too long ago that listed right here, all three that are going to be on the exam, chapters eight, nine, and 10. So you can get to them that way. Or as always, if you go to the classwork area and go to the specific chapter, like here we go on the left, chapter eight, and then you'll see right here, where is it at? Da, da, da. Right there, chapter eight, study guide. So let me click on that and we'll pull it up. All right, so you can, see, can you see now where it says chapter eight, study guide? Yes. Perfect, okay, it's making sure it's still showing. All right, oh, look at that. Number 32 happens to be the one that popped up uh, because it's, it's shuffled, but there it is. Anyway. Uh, are you actually like pulled up the study guide? Yes. Oh, because it still shows like in the stream. I can't see like the actual stuff. There we go. It just popped okay. up. Okay. Thank you. I'm glad you told me. All right. So, yeah, chapter number 32, one difference between mitosis and meiosis. Um, this, the biggest differences, let's just talk about the biggest differences because that's the most important. Um, first of all, in mitosis, you start, with, well, you always start with one cell. But in mitosis, you start with one, you end with two. In meiosis, you start with one, you end with four. Um, with mitosis, those new cells are genetically identical. With meiosis, those new cells are all genetically unique. Um, and speaking of which, with mitosis, they are completely, because they're identical, that means they also have the same amount of genetic information that you started with. Um, unlike in meiosis, you have half the amount of um, genetic information that you started with. And another way of saying that is, for mitosis, you end up with diploid cells, and, my, and meiosis, you end up with haploid cells. And then finally, the other last thing to say is in meiosis, you, you're you producing gametes, are you producing egg and sperm? And for mitosis, it's everything else. Whew. That being said, let's look at these options. Mitosis produces more daughter cells for each division than meiosis. So that's not correct, right? That's the opposite of correct, because meiosis ends up producing more. Now, that being said, I could reword that question, that option to make to make it the correct one by saying something like, um, you know, meiosis produces more as opposed to mitosis. Next option, mitosis produces haploid cells. No, but meiosis produces diploid cells. No, again, that's the opposite of correct. But I could reword that to make that the correct option. You know, I could say mitosis produces diploid, uh, meiosis produces haploid. Um, mitosis produces cells genetically identical to the parent cell. That is correct, but meiosis does not. There we go. So in this case, that is the correct answer. Um, and mitosis requires only one parent cell, but meiosis requires two. Now that's just completely out there. Now, if I were to have that option as, a, as um, an option on the exam, you would probably get partial credit for getting any of the other three, because at least 
has, at least that has something to do with um, reality. But um, this last one is completely made up. So you would get zero credit for that. So this is a good time for me to tell you a lot of the questions on the exam will be that way, where there's some really off the wall answers. And as long as you don't get the off the walls answers, um, then you might get partial credit. Um, one second, please. Okay, sorry about that. Now, so did you have any questions about number 32? Nope, that's all. All right, let's see. The next one then would be number 35. So let me pull that one up. Um, Thirty-five. Here we go. A karyotype, which says right there, is a chromosome display. Now, by the way, for the exam, I might not remind you that that's a picture of chromosomes. Right? That's something that you should know. So I might not remind you of that in the exam. Um, would be unable to to determine what, basically. So this is a good question. Just keep in mind that the only thing you can see with a, a karyotype is the chromosomes themselves, right? So you can see how many of them there are. You can see if there's anything physically wrong with them, like if they're missing a chunk. But that's it. So the only thing out of this, um, you could determine Down syndrome because remember Down syndrome is an extra chromosome. You could determine sex because then you could see if it's two X chromosomes or two Y chromosomes. Like you can physically see the difference. Eye color wouldn't work, right? Because eye color, that's a gene. That's an allele. So you're not actually seeing the code, the A's, the C's, the T's, and the G's. So that is the correct answer, right? You could not, you would be unable to tell um, the eye color. Of course, for the exam, I'm not going to use these same um, options. The point is that you need to know with a karyotype, you can only see, physically see the chromosome. So that's the only thing you can determine is something that you can determine by physically seeing the chromosomes. You can't see the actual code. So anything that involves seeing the genetic code, you know, you would not be able to determine that with a karyotype. So any questions about number 35? No, that makes sense now. All right. Let's see. Question 11. Um, and while I'm looking for that, I want to apologize for you and anyone watching the video. My son is home from school, and so is his friend, so it is a little bit louder than I would prefer. Anyway, question 11. Which of the following is a stage of mitosis? Oh, this one um, I was hoping wouldn't be a hard one. It's not a trick question. Interphase is the only stage of mitosis. I could see, all right, I can see two things that would be tricky, though, because I see this mistake a lot. First of all, interphase is not a part of mitosis. Because um, remember, the whole cell cycle is broken down into two basic parts. There's interphase. And then there's the mit mitotic phase, right? So interphase is a completely different part of the cell cycle. The people often make that mistake because every time we talk about mitosis, we still talk about interphase because we mentioned that in interphase, you know, or excuse me, when we talk about prophase, for example, we have to compare it to what it used to look like, which is what it looked like in interphase. So we say, you know, in interphase, the chromosomes aren't coiled up, unlike in prophase when they coil up. Um, and interphase is when the chromosomes are duplicated. So I could see why that would be confusing. Um, and cytokinesis, I don't like that. Technically, it depends that that's wordage, right? You could argue that that is a part of mitosis because that happens basically during telophase. So if I have this question on the exam, cytokinesis is not going to be an option because that is arguable. You could argue that that is a part of uh, mitosis. So it will not be ambiguous like that. However, interphase would be an option because for some reason, again, that confuses people. And it's not that I'm trying to confuse you. I just want to make sure that everybody knows interphase is not a part of mitosis. So that will be one of the incorrect options. Cytokinesis will not be. That's too um, too vague. Um, DNA synthesis, that might as well be the same as um, interphase as far as this conversation is concerned because DNA synthesis happens during interphase. So any questions about um, number 11? Nope. All right. Moving forward. Question eight, number 15. In meiosis, how does prophase one differ from prophase two? Hmm. 
All right, let me say this. I really don't like the way this one is worded, so I'm not even going to fully address it. Let's just say if I have any question, if I ask this question, you can just completely ignore these options. Here's what you need to focus on, on the options that I would give for the exam. And pro phase one or any of meiosis one, we're dealing with the homologous chromosomes, right? And then pro phase two or um, any part of meiosis two, we're dealing with sister chromatids. So just remember meiosis one, homologous chromosomes, meiosis two, uh, sister chromatids. Um, and the rest, like I said, I don't like the wording on this. I didn't, I don't write these questions. These come from your, the publisher of your textbook. So I'm not going to confuse anything or muddy up the water by even discussing um, this question, these options on the question. So does what I said make sense to you? I know I didn't clear up specific number 15 for the study guide, but does what I say make sense to you and prepare you for the exam? Uh, can you explain it one more time? I'm sorry. That's okay. No, that's what I'm here for. So there's a lot of things that are listed on this, right? For the options C and A and D and B, but I'm not even focused on that. The only thing I'm focused on that you need to know is that in meiosis one, whatever part of it, whether it's prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, no matter what, in meiosis one, we're dealing with the homologous chromosomes, right? So we're dealing with you know, chromosome one that you got from your mom and chromosome one that you got from your dad. Chromosome one that you, chromosome two that you got from your mom, chromosome two that you got from your dad, right? So meiosis one is all about those homologous chromosomes. That's, they're all doing their things. And then they split up. And then in meiosis two, I hope I didn't say that wrong. Sorry. Meiosis one, it's all homologous chromosomes. And meiosis two, they've already split up. So in meiosis two, we are now talking about the sister chromatids, like the same thing we talked about with um, mitosis, right? Meiosis two, as far as we're concerned, is the same as mitosis, as far as like what happens. It's the sister chromatids that we're looking at for meiosis two. So if you're taking notes, the shorthand would be meiosis one equals homologous chromosomes. Meiosis two equals sister chromatids. And that's it in a nutshell. All this other stuff, I'm not worried about. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Let's see. Next is chapter 8, question 38. Nucleosomes. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to make, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to ask this, but um, nucleosomes, if you remember from that picture, those are those little eight balls of protein with the DNA wrapped around them. Those particular um, balls of protein are called histone proteins. So the correct answer is D. Uh, nucleosomes are made up of DNA and histone, histone proteins. Let me look something up here. So, um, that's what it looks like. You can forget all those little letters and all that, but you remember you've got, like I said, you've got those eight little balls of protein, which are called histones, and then the DNA literally just wraps around them. And each one of those little areas where they wrap around those eight little balls of protein, that's called a histone. Um, any questions on that one? It was B, DNA? No, DNA and oh, B, okay. histone proteins, yeah. It's not just the DNA. It's the DNA that's wrapped around those eight balls of protein. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, let me see. Okay. Obviously, you want to reword it. There's not much I can do to reword that correct answer. That's what it is. It's DNA and it's protein. I guess I could, or histone proteins. I guess I could get a little bit broad with it and say DNA and proteins just to keep it a little bit. I mean, it would, that would change the wording. It would still be correct. But anyway, um, question 11. Oh, okay. So I, you, you had a typo on a question 11. Did you want me to address that or just move forward? Uh, you, you can just move forward. I got it now. Okay. Chapter 8, question 39. Plant cell cytokinesis differs from animal cell cytokinesis. And simply put, the biggest difference as far as we're concerned in this class, well, 
one of the few biggest differences um, between plant cells and animal cells is plant cells have a cell wall, animal cells don't. So that being said, thinking about that, let's look at these options. Animal cells form a cell plate. Nope, that is the opposite of true. The cell plate is the thing that makes up the cell wall. So obviously animal cells wouldn't do that, plant cells would. So if this were in the exam, if I flopped those around, switched those around, then that would be the correct answer. If it said plant cells form a cell plate and animal cells do not. Um, plant cells produce more daughter cells. That's way out there. Not, I never said anything about that. Animal cells produce more daughter cells. Again, way out there. I didn't say anything about that. And plant cells form a cell plate. Okay, so again, B would be the correct answer. Um, and if this were the exam, you would get partial credit for answering D because at least seems like you're kind of on the right track. And A and, B, A and C are completely just wrong, and I've never said anything like that. So those you would lose, you would get no credit for um, guessing A and C because they're completely out there. So again, this is a heads up and a, a hint for anybody who's studying. If you see something that completely doesn't make sense or doesn't seem like it belongs in this chapter, then don't answer. Don't use that as an answer because it is there to test you. So if you see anything that has to do with photosynthesis or respiration or let me think. Yeah, those are the, that's, that was the private, previous um, exam. So, yeah, if you see anything about like glycolysis, that's not the answer, right? That was from the last exam. Anyway, moving forward. Wait, sorry. Did you have any questions about number 39? No, I don't. Okay. The last one from chapter eight is number 36. Let's take a look at that. Sexual reproduction appears to be absent in these rotifers, which of these have found in the group would bring into question the idea that they reproduce only asexually. I wish we, I wish I had time to talk about it because it could be a good learning moment, but that won't be on the exam. So I'm just going to move forward because um, I am short on time. Uh, so, and again, that question will not be on the exam. Now we're moving to chapter nine. Let me pull that up. Actually, before we move to chapter nine, did you have any other questions from chapter eight? I, as far as I know, I got everything that you had listed anyway. Oh yeah, that was all. Okay. Chapter nine. Um, share this tab instead so I can get rid of this and get rid of this. Okay. Chapter nine, number 23, excuse me. What is the key to recognition of incomplete dominance? Yes, this is important. No, this is basically asking for the book's definition. Um, and that is that the phenotype of the heterozygotes falls between the phenotype of the homozygotes. Meaning if you had a purebred pink, uh, purebred red flower and a purebred white flower, right? And purebred is another way of saying homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive. So what falls between red and pink? And, or excuse me, what falls between red and white? And the answer is pink. So you do need to know that, but I will say most likely I won't ask it that way. I'll say something like, you know, I'll actually give the example. Instead of asking you for this definition, I'll say something like, I, I bred a purebred white flower with a purebred red flower and 25% of the offspring were pink, right? And, and then I would say, why? And the answer is because of incomplete dominance. And this is a good hint for you too. Um, when you see a question like that, and it's clearly like mixing the phenotypes, you can basically almost, unless I ask you a question about the numbers, then you can ignore the fact that the numbers, I'm really, I'll tell you right now, I'm just putting it there to distract you. If the phenotype falls between the two parental phenotypes, it is um, incomplete dominance, right? Forget the numbers. Those are distraction. Same thing with uh, co-dominance. So if I have a red flower and I breed it with a white flower and some of the offspring were red with white spots or white with red spots, right? That's both phenotypes showing. It's not in between, but it's both of them being expressed. That is co-dominance. And again, there'll be a question like that. It'll be something you've never heard up and heard of because I'm gonna completely make it up. And you just need to recognize it and say, okay, if it's showing both phenotypes, 
then that is co-dominance. Forget all the numbers, unless I'm asking you about the numbers. Um, and the answer would be co-dominance. So anyway, any questions about number 23? No. All right, moving forward. 20, same chapter, number 21. Chondroplasia is a form of dwarfism caused by a dominant allele. So pause that. That means if it's caused by a dominant allele, strictly based off of that one sentence. Now, it's about to get a little bit more complicated. But based on that one sentence, that means if somebody has, if somebody's homozygous dominant and they have both of those alleles, they're going to have it. If somebody is heterozygous and they only have one dominant and one recessive alleles, but it doesn't matter because this is a dominant trait right so no matter what as long as you have that one dominant trait you're going to show it or that one dominant allele you're going to show the trait so that being said let's make it a little bit more complicated um, the homozygous dominant genotype causes death so even though i just said anything homozygous dominant meaning you have both both of your alleles are dominant normally that would mean you express the dominant trait right but in this case this is an interesting situation that we learned about in lecture. And I told you, you didn't have to memorize it because I told you the question would give you the pertinent information as this one does. So we know that anybody who has two dominant alleles for this is dead. They don't even exist, right? So that means anybody who has it, any of these dwarfs, they have to be heterozygous. First of all, let's make sure you understand that concept because again, if you are homozygous dominant, I mean, you're dead, you don't exist. If you're homozygous recessive, that means you have two recessive alleles. That means you don't have a dominant allele. That means you don't have the condition, right? So the only way in this particular case for you to have a chondroplasia is for you to be heterozygous. All right. That being said, if a person with a chondroplasia mates with a person who does not have a chondroplasia, what percentage of their children would be expected to have it? All right. Let me try something different real quick. Uh, One second. I'm going to try something. Let's hope this works. Hopefully at this point, you can see my entire screen. And I'm going to try to open up a whiteboard so I can draw something here. Come on, you can do it. I'm gonna. It's gonna share it with you, but it really doesn't matter if you if it's shared with you or not because you should be able to see it because I'm presenting my entire screen. But here we go. Oh, come on. There we go. So you can see this whiteboard, correct? Yeah. All right. So the question is asking somebody who has a chondroplasia. First of all, let me write that down. Come on. Yeah, we'll do red why not all right so they have a chondroplasia so that means they have to be heterozygote and i'm just choosing a because that's that makes sense a was a chondroplasia the the actual letter doesn't matter so okay the person who has a chondroplasia that's that person mates with and what was the other one who are they mating with can you refresh my well i don't know if you have it pulled up in front of you so let me uh with the person who doesn't have it okay good with a person who does not have it. There we go. So that means they would have to be homozygous recessive. So we're saying what happens if these people mate? So we just do a Punnett square. Excuse me for the sloppiness. So here we have this person here. They go through meiosis. Their alleles split up. So 50% of their sperm or egg are going to be big A. 50% are going to be little a. This person, yeah, their sperm or their, their alleles will also split up during meiosis, but they only have little a's to offer. So, you know, 100% of their sperm or egg will be little a. So then we look at these possibilities. We have a big A, little a here. We have a little a, little a here. Again, a big A and a little a. And then we have another little a, little a. So, and I forgot exactly what the question was asking, but really quickly, if the question was saying, how many of their offspring would, um, or what are the chances that their offspring would have it? Well, 
50%, right? Because there's a 50% chance there would be heterozygous and a 50% chance that they would be homozygous recessive. So if that's what it's asking, then there's a 50% chance for either one. And let me go look to be sure that's what it says. Basically, so this exactly the way it's worded is it says what percentage of the children would be expected to have a contraplasia? Yes. And that is basically the same thing I said. It's just wording it a different way, and you should be ready for it to be worded a different way in the exam, which is I'm saying what person what are the chances of their offspring having it? And they're saying again, like if they were to have four children, how many would you expect to have it? And the answer is 50%. So are there any questions about how I figured that out? No, it makes sense. Okay. Um, and really quickly, keep in mind that I, I might change things up. I might say, what if uh, somebody with a chondroplasia mates with somebody with a chondroplasia, right? And then you have to do a completely different Punnett square. Um, and I just know I'm not going to go make you go through this with me. And I just happen to know because I've done it a lot of times. If we're mating two heterozygotes, what you're going to have as a result is uh, big A, big A, and then two big A, little A's, and then one little A, little A. I just know that's what, what the chances would be. So if those, if I was asking about that, what if I make two dwarves, what are the chances that they would be, um, that their kids would have dwarfism? And again, the answer would be 50%. Or I might say, what are the chances that the kid would be not have a chondroplasia? The answer is 25%. Or I might say, what are the chances that the child won't even make it? And that would, again, be 25% because there's a 25% chance that it would be homozygous dominant. And one last thing to make it a little bit more complicated, and anybody who watches this video will be ready for it if I do it, but let me ask you this. Forget all this achondroplasia talk. Let's say, uh, well, do you have a sister by any chance? Oh, no. Let's no, forget that. Let's just talk about you. Let's say you're pregnant right now. What are the chances that when you have that baby, it's going to be a boy? 50%. Yes. So to make this question a little bit more complicated, and you have to be ready for it, you're going to read exactly. It's going to look a lot like it did on the study guide, but then at the end, it'll say something like, not like, what are the chances that the kid will have dwarfism? It'll say, what are the chances that they'll have a boy with dwarfism or a girl with dwarfism? And that's a good time to remind you of the rules of probability. So 50% is also one half. So the rules of probability state, if you're talking about two events, two separate events, then you have to multiply it. So the chances of them having a boy, you know, 50% or one half. Chances of them having a contraplasia, one half. Chances of both of those things happening is the product. So one half times one half is one fourth. So the chances of them having a boy or a girl, whatever. Chances of them having a boy with a contraplasia would be one fourth or 25%. Any questions about that? Daddy. I'm on. Any questions about that? No. Okay. So let me close that out. Sorry if these are a little bit long-winded, but, you know, I don't want to just teach you how to do the exam. I want to teach you the concepts. Um, all right. Let me stop presenting this. Let's start presenting this again. Where did you go? Study guide. Yes. All right. So that brings us to, wait, we just did number 21, I think. Yeah. Question 40 is, okay. I see that. Chapter 9, question 26. Okay. This is going to be the last one for chapter 9. What is the key to recognition of co-dominance? So again, this is like that incomplete dominance question that I answered earlier. The way this study guide is asking it is basically they're asking you for the definition. And the definition would be um, the heterozygotes express both phenotypes, right? So instead of it falling in between, then it would express both. Like the example I gave of the red flower crossed with a white flower, some of the offspring are red with white spots, right? As opposed to pink. So that is the answer to that. And again, the question won't be written like this. The question will say, I made it this thing. I made it that thing. Here's the results. What is it? And you should recognize that. And then when I say, what is it? Then the choices are going to be complete dominance, incomplete dominance, co-dominance, pleiotropy, um, multigenic inheritance or polygenic inheritance and all, all that, right? Then the answer in that case would be co-dominance. So any questions about that? No.
All right, sorry about that. So that, okay, so did you have any other questions from chapter nine? That was all. Okay, let me X out of that. Let me pull up chapter 10. Mm -hmm. Chapter 10. Let me share this with you. Nope. Now, as I'm sharing this, I'll remind anybody who's watching this video, if, you, if you're watching it early enough, if you have a question that I did not address in this video, email me. Either we can meet again and I can try to make a second video, or maybe I can at least just email you the answer if I get the questions in time. So, you know, don't feel like... Um, don't feel like you're out of luck. Anyway, number 10. Looks like you only had one question from number 10, or chapter 10, not number 10. Let's see, and that would be number 43. Well, this could be promising because usually the ones that are that late probably won't even be on the exam. I don't know if I'm going to have this or not, but here's how it'll work. Um, Image for number three. Oh, I see the problem. It's all, it's all. Uh, yeah, the the pictures don't match up with them. Um, with the numbers, yeah. So here it is. So this is also good advice for anybody doing the study guides. I guess I can help clear this up for you as well. So the image for number forty-three, and I've searched for. You can see up at the top. I've searched for forty-three. So let me look at the next instance of forty-three. Okay, there we go. And that brings me to the actual question, which should be right next to each other but you know technology so it's not anyway examine the genetic code below well what should have been that picture that i showed you earlier um the codon agc codes for the amino acid what and hint the first letter is all you need okay so by first letter i mean like arginine would be a serine would be an s alanine would be an a obviously that's an issue but that wouldn't be an issue on the exam i would make sure that didn't happen because you can't have two of the same um anyway a, G, C. This is more important than these exact questions or these exact options because, first of all, I would give you three different letters than A, C, G, A, G, C. It would be something completely different. But if you get a question like this, let's look at those three letters, A, G, C. So we start in the middle. A, all right, that's the green one. All right, the next is G, right? So I'm working my way out. So G is the next one. And then, again, I'm working my way out. So I go to C. So the answer would be S. Now for the exam, to keep things simpler, if I did something like that, you know, it wouldn't have the full name, like arginine and leucine and serine and tryptophan, tryptophan. It wouldn't, wouldn't say that. It would literally just say your options would be, all right, if your code, I would give you some code like, I don't know, G, A, C. And I would say, what amino acid does that code for? And your, your multiple choice options would say something like D, E, G, or F. And the answer would be D, because you go G, A, C, and that brings you to the D there. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So if I have this question on the exam, again, keep in mind that I'm going to do a completely different code. Um, also keep in mind, I'm try I will try to fix this mistake that we just had where they aren't right next to each other. But if you come across it, you know, just pay close attention to the label, because like I said, it says right there, image number 43. So when you get to number 43 and then you read it, like what, what table shown below? And again, I will try to uh, eliminate that confusion in the exam, but just in case it happens again, now you know what to look for. Um, yeah, so that's it. Did you have any other questions about chapter 10? Uh, no, but I think the reason why it does that is because the questions are shuffled. So it yes. might have like, shuffled it. Yeah, it is shuffled. Um, and what should and what my plan to do, what I plan to do for the exam, if it's possible, is have that picture incorporated into the question instead of having them consecutively, because like you said, they're shuffled. So it doesn't matter if they're consecutive, if they're shuffled. So if, if I'm able to actually incorporate that into a question, I will. But you can see here, this little box, it's not a question. It's just an image. So if I can incorporate an image into a particular question, that's exactly how I'll do it. All right. Anything else? That's all. All right. I guess one more thing, like I said to you earlier about the extra credit. Well, I won't even repeat it. 
but you hopefully you remember what I said about the extra credit. But I guess the second thing about extra credit, I guess if you watch this video just for a little bit of extra credit, or and you don't have to because you're live, but if you've watched this video until the end, um, send me an email. I don't know. Just send me a couple of sentences in the email that prove that you watched the video, and I'll give you five points of extra credit towards your independent work, which, and again, I'm using quotation marks because that is now extra credit anyway. So that's it. Yes. All right. Well, good luck tomorrow. Um, I'll be online if you need me. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good day.